Welcome back. Well, we are still at the Fancy Schmancy Antique Mall. And although I have huge amounts of footage for you, I thought today we would go back to like the real shopping things. So nothing uh, on today's video, at least nothing that I purchased, is over $10 because as you know, that's what I promise myself when I walk in the store. Anybody can go into an antique mall and with an unlimited budget, buy something, get great deals, etc. But what we're trying to do here is show that you can go into the fancy antique mall and you can get bargains at thrift store prices. So when we come back. Well, before we get started, Remember this, this is one of the canisters, and it was a set of four that I paid $20 for. Um, the only thing I have done to this so far, I haven't even washed them, was I oiled the lids because the lids were very dried out, and I can't bear to see wood in that condition regardless. So looks much, much nicer with a little bit of oil on it. The reason I am telling you about this is because I did a little research on this. If you will recall, I had said that um, $20 was over my budget. You know, it exceeds my $10 limit, but I couldn't leave them behind. Very glad I didn't. I've been pricing them. That set of four canisters should probably retail for over $200. And it is getting those prices uh, on eBay right now. In fact, the smaller canisters are selling for $30 and another $10 shipping. So, and that's just a single canister. With the whole set, yeah, over $200. So, I am glad I got them. And no, I'm not selling them for anywhere near that much. That's, you know, when I say I don't mind putting a few nicer, more expensive items in my Etsy shop, no, that doesn't mean I'm putting $200 items in there. Not happening. But still, very, very good deal. And I would absolutely say, if you are looking for resale bargains, can't go wrong with a bargain like that. So I did want to give you the update on that piece. Now, first item we are looking at, and at this point I was up on the, uh, I believe this, the third floor. Sorry, the third floor. There are four floors there, and we have gone through many of them. But as I say, with four floors, I've got footage you wouldn't believe. And I am going to try to give you a really good overview of the whole thing. But I thought today I'd stick with purchases. Uh, third floor, I went to a little shop where I've gotten some cute things at very reasonable prices. And I started looking around there. So the first thing I saw in this booth was a little um, piece of Japanese porcelain. So Japanese porcelain, you got to know, that was coming home with me. So let's take a look. We have what is probably a nut dish, um, hand-painted Nippon, beautiful piece. Uh, ordinarily, these would have come uh, with a large dish, um, eight to ten inches across, and about eight of these little pieces. 
The price on this is $5, and this may well be coming with me. Now that is from this booth here. We're just going to take a quick overview because I have gotten nice pieces in here in the past at very good prices. So we're going to look carefully here to make sure we don't miss any deals. I see pieces like this often. Um, they are generally called nut dishes, although I honestly cannot imagine that that would have been their original use. Ordinarily, there is a large plate or, a, well, a plate, the size of a cake plate, for example, of about eight to 10 inches and um, six or eight little tiny dishes. They say they are nut dishes. No idea what to make of that. I've never seen in my long history on this planet anyone serving nuts on a plate as opposed to a bowl or handing them out in little little tiny dishes. I actually believe that there was some other purpose for these plates. Nevertheless, they are very cute and they have wonderful uses today. You know, change dishes, uh, little ring cups, things like that. Uh, there is no lack of use for the little pieces or even the large plate with a whole bunch of, for example, little sauce dishes. I can see that. But that was not the way food was served a hundred years ago. So they had some other purpose for it. And I have yet to figure out what it is. Still, $5, beautiful little piece of antique uh, Nippon, China. Oh yeah, coming home with me. And it did. Then I wanted to look around and see if there was anything else interesting in that booth. And I did find some interesting things. So here we go. Even though, by the way, these did not come home with me. Okay, Occupied Japan. Tall ship plates, 12, let's see, it's $12 for this one. And this is English China. Let's see where we were made. Um, no, it's the old North Church. Yes, it is. All right. This is bizarre. This is the old North Church. That is in Boston. That was a pivotal uh, feature in the uh, legends that sprang up after the American Revolution. So, here we have an English-made piece, in effect, celebrating the defeat of of England, go figure. Um, at 450, I may think about that. Very pretty plates. And we're going to take a closer look at these pieces and check some prices as well. The occupied Japan plates were very nice. Uh, I've gotten a lot of blue and white china from Japan, from China, from occupied Japan. Um, they're really lovely, well-made pieces, and I enjoy having them because they're terrific for tidbit trays. I'm sure I've mentioned I get requests frequently for tidbit trays in the range of blue, and these are certainly in the range of blue. But boy, did I get a kick out of those plates from England with the Old North Church. Now, the Old North Church, um, that's uh, the midnight ride of Paul Revere, one if by land, two if by sea, you know, swinging the lantern in the church. That's part of our mythos uh, from the American Revolution. Paul Revere rode from, I think, like Boston to Cambridge. Um, it was, it was a tiny little ride. Meanwhile, um, 
uh, there was a guy named this Israel Bissell, and he made the massive ride. Uh, he went from, I think, from Massachusetts right through to Connecticut, through to New York. Um, so he didn't get credit, but Paul Revere did. So that's why I say it's the legend. It's, it's not the truth. The truth is that ride was taken on by others. There was also a young woman whose name I cannot remember. She was just a girl. When I say young woman, she was only about 15 or 16. She got on her horse and she rode too. So the, um, the British surprise attack wasn't a surprise, but not because of Paul Revere, not because of the Old North Church. But it just struck me as ironic that a British China company would celebrate one of England's great defeats. You know, the loss of America. Wow. Um, but nevertheless, beautiful little plates. Um, I really, really enjoy that little booth because there are treasures there. A lot of what is there is not not particularly old and not fine quality. So I like being able to go in and pull out the goodies. Um, and the goodie, there was one, was that wonderful little Nippon dish. All right, I found another Nippon piece at yet another booth there. So let's take a look at this. Okay, we have an interesting piece here. Very, very pretty. Um, it is marked hat pin holder. No. Now, let's just take a quick peek at this. It is a single salt or pepper shaker. Now, however, it is hand painted and we have a mark that is probably from one of the, it's probably one of the Japanese marks. I believe it is Nippon. Six dollars. You know, I'm probably going to take it with me. It's not what the seller says it is, but it is a really gorgeous piece. And as I've mentioned before, I have no problem dealing in, in unmatched salt and pepper sets. They are far too useful for cinnamon or paprika or even red pepper if that's what you like to use. Um, yeah, for $6, I think that's coming home with me. Oh yeah, that's not a hat pin holder. The minute I saw it, I knew it was not a hat pin holder because it's salt and pepper shaker size. Well, you saw me holding it in my hand. It's that big. Hat pin holders are about this big. Usually, when you see something that is erroneously described as a hat pin holder, it's not a salt shaker. It's a muffineer, a taller salt shaker that usually contained cinnamon, powdered sugar, or a combination of the two that you would sprinkle on um, muffins or like cakes. That doesn't surprise me when you see that mix up because a lot of people are not even aware that there is a legitimate shaker called a muffineer. And if it's this big, why wouldn't you think it's a hat pin holder? In this case, no, it was just a really nice individual shaker, beautifully painted. And I don't have trouble with, with that uh, as something to sell, an individual shaker. Yes, there is absolutely a market for it. But the way you tell the difference, and you saw what I did, I pulled the label off the bottom and that hole for the cork tells me it's a shaker. If it has a hole in the bottom for a cork, 
Now, it doesn't matter whether it's still got the cork. That hole tells you at one time a cork was there. Then it's a shaker or a muffineer. A hat pin holder will not have a hole in the bottom. Think about it. If you pick it up to take out your hat pin and there's a hole, the sharp pointy ends of your pin are poking down. Whoa, design flaw. So no, they wouldn't they would never have put holes in the bottom of a hat pin holder. It not only wouldn't make sense, but it would be dangerous because you could poke your fingers on the pins and you could damage your hat pins if it's hanging out loose. You know, your pin could get bent. So no, no, hole in the bottom is shaker. No hole, hat pin holder. So easy rule of thumb. Um, I saw another booth, and I'm not sure, but I think this booth may be, um, the, the booth, and I, I, I use that term loosely because they have all kinds of things. They have china cabinets on stair landings that are booths. I believe this next booth upcoming had formerly been located in a china closet on the stair landing because I'm sure I recognize one or two of the pieces. This booth has a lot of very nice Asian china, lusterware in particular, uh, Noritake, Nippon, sugar and creamers, all those things that I love. They're a little pricey. I've gotten good deals from them, but what I saw there the last time I was there was a little pricey, mostly orphaned pieces. So let's take a look. Well, here we have a very pretty Noritake sugar bowl at $10. It's a little high for me, um, but nice looking. And I have been over here taking a look at all of their little orphaned pieces, and there are many of them. Orphaned creamers, single cups and saucers, um, all very pretty, but just a tiny bit on the high side. Now, when I talk about orphaned pieces, I'm talking about a sugar bowl without the creamer, or in some cases, a sugar bowl with no lid. Um, and this booth did have sugar bowls with no lids that were priced beyond anything I consider reasonable. I don't care if you are a fancy schmancy antique store. A sugar bowl with no lid. Well, if you're a fancy schmancy antique store, I'm not sure it belongs on your shelves. But a sugar bowl with no lid. Unless it is a remarkably good piece should probably not be going for more than five dollars and I consider five dollars very high for a lidless sugar bowl. Um, creamers, sugar bowls like that, no. Um, when you get into ten, twelve dollars, that is the very top of the market. So, no. I walked away from all of those, but I do like looking at them. And as I say, even though I find most of their prices a little too steep for me, I have gotten some great things there at really good prices. So I'm always going back to look. And you never know what you're going to come up with. Um, I found another piece. It did not come home with me, even though I threatened to buy it. it it's a Chinese covered dish relatively modern. Uh, in other words, this is second half 20th century, not an antique piece. Um, vintage, but not really old. Just a very pretty piece. I thought it was nice looking, so I decided to film it for you. And let's take a look and I'll tell you why. So here's another piece that is a little bit over that self-imposed $10 price point I use here, $15. This is a covered dish, blue and white, 
extremely pretty. And I am thinking of making an exception for this because I think it's worth it. Well, the why is that blue and white pieces have been a staple of Chinese porcelain for centuries. Uh, Canton ware is blue and white. Willow ware, blue and white. Um, and you can see a lot of very nice pieces. But today, modern times, late 20th, early 21st century, some of these pieces are coming into the country once again. If you are looking at pieces like this, you need to be very cautious because you may think you're buying an old piece, but it could, in fact, be a new piece. And with the Chinese, it's hard to go by the markings. And we've discussed this before. Um, you can have a piece that was made um, last week in China, and it will have a mark that indicates it's from a period 200 years ago. This, a lot of people will say, well, that's fraud. No, no. It's like if we go into Baker Furniture and see a beautiful chest of drawers in the style of Chippendale, 1700s, and we say, oh, look, that's a Chippendale piece. Everyone knows. We don't mean it's a real Chippendale piece from the 18th century. We mean it's in the style of Chippendale. Same thing with the Chinese. It's just, they will use a mark to indicate a style and not a date but we don't process that information out the same way. And as I say, the best way I can do it is there, you know, we could go to a store tomorrow and buy a Gothic piece of furniture and the Gothic era ended in the 16th century. Um, imagine what that would be like for a Chinese buyer who might very well think, but it said Gothic. It's just a, difference in how we use terms. So when you are getting China, in particular the blue and white pieces, you really need to do your homework because many of these styles have been made and produced with very little variation for two, three, four hundred years. A piece that you could buy today might be virtually identical to a 400-year-old antique, the only differences being, you know, the crazing on the glaze or the wear marks, being able to tell the difference between an old piece and a new piece. On the other hand, if you have a 400-year-old piece and you have a 30-year-old piece that someone used out on the front porch, you know, as a saucer for that old potted plant, you could very well be taken in. So always be cautious because the marks do not necessarily mean anything. There's nothing we can sort out. All right. Um, let's take um, a look. And this will be our final piece for today. And this falls into the category of why this and not that. I will tell you right now, I found a beautiful Bavarian dish hand-painted little violets, I guess, and I did not buy it. So, I'm sure you're all thinking, no, Sue, really, no, I have not been kidnapped. There is not some pod people in the background or anything. No. Well, let me explain why I didn't buy it. So let's take a look. Okay, a little bit of why this and why not that. This at $5 is a hand-painted piece of China, uh, originally from Bavaria, but it's likely an artist painted it after it was fired. And let's see if you can see. Right here, we have some scratches. Well, let me get this over here so it's not in the light. Right here. Now, when I run my finger across that, I can tell 
these are scratches in the paint. And I am not comfortable with that. Also, I'm not quite sure what this is. It looks like it might have been some other damage to the paint. So, despite the fact that I am a total sucker for these beautiful hand-painted pieces, this is one that will not be coming with me. So, Bavarian China, hand-painted, beautiful design, not enough. That piece had scratching on it. I hope you could see it. It was, it was hard. It was hard for me to tell visually what was wrong with that design, because of course, whenever you deal with hand painted china, the designs are busy, and you know you can hide a lot of damage in an intricate design. But when I ran my finger across it, I could clearly feel the scratches. And then there was another area that I don't know. It just it, it looked like there was like a blotch on it. I'm not sure. I don't know what that was about. That was not coming home with me. It's too bad. Before whatever damage took place, I'm sure that was an incredibly beautiful piece. But when I buy items one of the first things I look for is condition. I do not want to sell damaged items. And the best way to avoid selling damaged items is not to buy them in the first place. Having said that, there have been times when I've gotten items that have had minor damage. Um, some have even had more than minor damage. If I've been able to get a good enough bargain on them and I can pass them on and I feel that it's likely there will be buyers interested. For example, I got a cut crystal sugar and creamer set and there was, there was scuffing on that crystal, but it was in the cut part where the design was. I got a good bargain. Throw that out at a good price. Someone might not have any issue at all about that. This may be the sugar and creamer set that is going to sit on their kitchen table or out on the table on the back patio. Uh, it's just they would like to have something nice. And this will do fine for that. Um, damage is not always a deal killer. Um, but if it's a lot of damage, if it's conspicuous damage, if it's damage to the design, usually no. I will ordinarily walk away from it. And I had to with this piece. I really felt that that was just not happening, not coming home with me. All right, so I still have plenty of footage from the um, Fancy Schmancy Antique Mall. Uh, I will probably show you some of the other things I bought there on tomorrow's video. But in the meantime, let me know. Do you want to see their booths? I've asked some of you have said you'd love to see the American country, and I will probably end up going back and doing something more detailed in terms of American country. But I have a lot of uh, sort of overviews of their booths. I have a lot of film of furniture. Let me know, because the whole point of this is I want you to see what you want to see. All right. Have a terrific day. I will be back tomorrow with more from this shopping trip. And in the meantime, let's just take a look at some of Liz's uh, photographs from Brown Haven Studios. Mm -hmm.